Testing. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, paper session 2B on Friday morning for our GLIPA fun and games. And just in case you're wondering, the exit is right behind you. And if you run outside, that would be the fire exit. And our first presenter is Renee Kerrigan. And am I forgetting something? No, I think we're good. So welcome, Renee. Thanks for coming today. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Peggy Hernandez from the Elgin School District U46 Planetarium in Elgin, Illinois. Okay. Hello everyone, I'm Renee Kerrigan. I am the Planetarium Director and the Curator of Science at the Peoria Riverfront Museum, which is a multi And like many people here, um, we at the museum have a lot of field trips, right? We get a lot of, of children uh, coming to the museum with a trip. Uh, for most of the museum's history, that was uh, pretty much organized by the teachers on a case-by-case, class-by-class basis. So, you know, a teacher looks at our website, is interested in bringing in a class, and they organize it with our field trip coordinator. But in 2017, we got a new CEO, John Morris, and his board, or the museum, told him that like their main goal was for the museum, was for him to get the museum uh, more deeply connected to Peoria Public Schools, um, and to connect better with all of the students of Central Illinois. And so uh, he is a very, <laughs> if you uh, he wants everything to be first, best, or only. Uh, and so he said, well, okay, we're going to connect with every student in central Illinois every year, which is an ambitious goal. But the way we went about trying to fulfill that goal, I think, um, was really useful to He started the Every Student Initiative with the goal to get uh, every student in Central Illinois connected to the Peoria Riverfront Museum program. Uh, so our main school district uh, is Peoria Public Schools, and that has in kindergarten through eighth grade about 8,000 students. qualify for free and reduced lunch and um, so there's a lot of reasons why we would want to do more outreach to Peoria Public Schools. We before 
100 students of the 8,000 students. Um, so we wanted to try to get them all, kindergarten through eighth grade, through the museum every year on a field trip. So uh, we knew there was interest from a local foundation, and so we have a verbal commitment of support from a, a local foundation for this program. And then we had to get buy-in from Peoria Public Schools. So uh, John, uh, my boss, uh, worked with uh, the superintendent, Dr. Karat, who is in the middle of this picture, and asked her if she'd be willing to send all of her the costs of their field trip covered. And she said, yes, absolutely, um, but also I need your support for So that meant we had to raise quite a bit of money to cover the field trips because it wasn't just covering the time uh, at the museum and the museum staff time, but we also needed to cover the cost of busing. Um, but having her buy-in was 100% essential because we needed the organization from the school district to be able to get this quantity of students through the museum. So uh, she was on board and that allowed us to secure funding. We got a large a donation from a private foundation to start us off. Then we had several. The thing that surprised me and makes me feel um, good about the program or even better about the program is that a lot of individual givers contributed to the program. People who are regular museum members, so like many museums, we have a membership, you pay a certain amount of money, and then you can come to the museum all year. But people would add on to their membership to support this program um, because they knew that it was not only helping support the museum, but also supporting local students. And that was something a lot of people feel good about. So uh, the bar that's Polly Barton in the center, and those are a lot of the students who came in the first year. And uh, in the first year, we were successful at getting uh, about 7,000 of the 8,000 students from Peoria Public Schools, kindergarten through eighth grade, in a curriculum coordinated field trip to the museum. So that was another difference. A lot of the times when a teacher comes to you to plan a field trip, you know, they have something that they have in mind for what they want to, their class to do. Um, but because we were sort of scheduling these in scale, so we were scheduling whole grade levels at a time, we worked with the district to know what the students, the themes the students would be planning that year. And then we tried to match the activities they were doing in our galleries to some of the themes that they were learning that year. They also saw either a flat screen, giant screen theater film, or went to the planetarium for a lesson with every field trip. So for an example, this is fourth grade, and at the time of this visit, we had an art exhibition at the museum and um, so fourth graders studying the personal narrative and literature that year. And so the activity that they did, um, something in the art exhibit, look for personal narratives in the art exhibit, and then they did a writing activity. In science that year, they were studying energy in the environment, so they saw dynamic earth and did a little lesson in the planetarium. Uh, we also created educator guides for each grade level with pre and post visit activities and we put them all on our website and we were we tried to get these to the teachers and uh, that was a challenge so the biggest challenge uh, was being able to communicate with the teachers um, because teachers emails are protected for we frequently did not have the, the lead teacher's email uh, to be able to communicate with them uh, directly about the school, about the field trip. We would be able to have the principal's email perhaps, but maybe not the lead teacher's email for each school because it wasn't the teacher scheduling the field trip. It was the school district scheduling the field trip. Um, so we put them all on our website and we, uh, we would do our best to get them to the teachers, but it, it did not always happen. Um, here's just a few other pictures of um, some students in our galleries and some of the activities that they did. So the goal was always for them to visit, visit the exhibition but also have a concentrated activity that more directly tied to what they were studying in school. Um, we have a partnership with the Jewish Federation of 
Peoria uh, to have a, a Holocaust memorial on our grounds. Um, every button represents somebody who is killed in the tragedy of the Holocaust. Um, so they, this is studied in sixth and eighth grade, and so the students had a very uh, visual connection to that, what they were studying. And in eighth grade, the Jewish Federation also had volunteers who would come and talk to the students, which was really powerful. Frequently, it was somebody who had a personal story to tell um, that about the, the experience. So as I've indicated, the, the biggest challenge was teacher communication and ownership. So we were able to get the large volume of students through the museum because it was organized from the top down. We went to the, the district superintendent, then we worked with the curriculum coordinator, and we worked with people in the administration level to schedule, like I said, entire grade levels. Uh, for example, like in March, we would have all the fourth graders um, from the whole district through the museum. Um, but that meant that sometimes the bus would show up at the school to pick up the students, and the teacher would not know it was coming. <laughs> and then they may not come that day. Or um, maybe they found out about it late. Maybe they didn't get our pre and post visit activities. Or they just didn't have ownership over that field trip because they didn't personally reach out to schedule it. That being said, there was a lot of successes with this program. The biggest, in my mind, is that students who did not have access to the museum before for many reasons were coming to the museum on repeat visits, and they were associating the museum with fun and learning. And so hopefully, they will grow up to be museum people, right? That they will associate that with fun and learning throughout their lives. Um, we saw students returning and bringing their families. So because they had been to the museum, it felt like a friendly place to them. We saw them bringing their families on the weekends and in the summer, and that was always a good feeling. We did send out surveys, and overall we got good teacher feedback that they appreciated the experience that they had at the museum um, with the few caveats, as there always are. Um, and like I said, it was a very appealing program for museum donors. So it actually um, it not only covered the costs of, of the field trips, but it started to just help support the museum as a whole because, like I said, um, not just the, the big gifts that were given to help sort of launch the program, but individual donors were like, oh, the museum's working with all these school children and they get to visit for free? That sounds great, you know, let's, we want to support that. So for example, we have what's called the Visionary Society at the museum. Um, they are donors who give $1,000 or more a year. And when we started this program in 2017, there was 100 people in it, and today there are 370 people in it. So, and, and largely, we have had feedback that one of the main things that drives that growth is the fact that we are working with the schools in this Every Student Initiative. So in 2020, uh, we were closed for about seven months of the year. So we had to create a virtual program. Uh, we used Google Classroom to have a field trip all about the exploration of Mars and the Perseverance rover. Um, and I'll be honest, I think that was only semi-successful. We were a little late in putting it together. And some teachers used it, but certainly not all of the teachers in the district. Um, but the biggest success of our virtual outreach, not exactly virtual outreach, our, our sort of uh, different outreach that we did in 2020 was when we were open, we created a student and family fun pass because the students hadn't been able to visit in person with their classes. Um, we had this pass that we sent to all the students in the district that they could come for free and bring their families. And um, if they visited the planetarium, the galleries, and the giant screen theater, they got another pass to come back later and uh, see our big traveling show, which is T-Rex, the ultimate predator right now, that usually has a significant upcharge. So it would be out of reach probably for a lot of these families. Um, and that was really popular. Um, so, so overall, the biggest success is that we now have students who, this picture, these ladies are showing off that they've been to the, planet, the museum three years in a row. And um, so, Students feel ownership of the museum. They've come every year. 
and uh, now it, it feels like a place that they know. Um, and we have also grown past Peoria Public Schools. Now, East Peoria Public Schools are part of the program, which is a smaller community right across the river. Um, a couple of very small rural school districts are involved, and then five, uh, five private religious schools are involved. And so if we find a sponsor who's willing to pay for the school, then we can get all of the students from the school into the museum in this program. And uh, like I said, we try to raise about twenty dollars uh, per student to be able to support the whole thing. Overall, it has uh, helped the students. It's created created access to the museum to people who would not students who would not be able to visit otherwise, and that's uh, the tremendous success. But it has also supported the museum financially uh, in a year where. We can all use that. We have about 70% of our, our budget is um, philanthropic support, so it's really important to us. Uh, but uh, seeing all the kids at the museum every year is And I think that this program could work in other places. So if you have any questions about how you might be able to implement it in your place, I'd be happy to help. And I think I only have 14 seconds for questions left. <laughs> Thank you. Down to four seconds for questions. Everybody good? Okay, thank you very much, Renee. So find me later if you have any questions. Thank you. Welcome to paper session two. I see we have some new, new attendees coming in. My name is Peggy Hernandez. I'll be the moderator. And we have a three-minute changeover here for the next speaker to come up. All right, for presenter number two. Well, hello everybody, I'm John Potts. I'm with the Saginaw Valley State University. I'm currently domeless, but I'm also here to uh, do some shopping for maybe a portable. But uh, I'm with the physics department. Had a past year that's very challenging. So is the physics department. And we really wanted to have our student, that we, went, we switched to remote learning, and we wanted to have our students to still have quickly put together a uh, lab kit that we could send out to the students that they could perform these experiments at home. And well, took a lot, but here, yeah, the pen, there we go. I'm just ahead of myself. Uh, we began to develop and work on these laboratory exercises that could be student, could be performed by the students at home with minimal equipment. In addition to the uh, equipment, we had a experiment, a uh, a theory video, a uh, a uh, execution video, kind of showing them. for themselves and then finally an analysis video where the students would uh, analyze their data and a lot of this we had to do the uh, you know to organize their data so uh, the requirements of this lab kit of course were low cost we're going to mail these out to the students uh, minimum specialized equipment from suppliers and where we could locally use locally purchased items and if we couldn't find anything that would work from locally purchased items 
equipment in house. And some of it was as simple as a binder clip to hold up a little screen that they would use to project the uh, images on. But today, there we go. This is the kits that we came up with, or the experiments we included in the kit, speed of sound, simple circuits, magnetic induction, magnetic force, Snell's law, refraction in uh, different mediums, lenses and mirrors, and then interference and diffraction. And interference and diffraction, the ex that experiment, is uh, what I'm going to talk about today, The uh, what we came up with. And that was with uh, this little setup. It uses a laser pointer, and there's a cradle that holds the laser pointer, and then we have three inserts that fit into the front. The ring on the, uh, on the uh, cradle there holds down the power button on the laser pointer so it can work continuously. And our three inserts are a single slit, a double slit, and a uh, wire to uh, interfere into the uh, laser beam. And here are our three patterns we would get. The top one is the single slit, the second interference pattern is the double slit, and the bottom is our uh, thin wire. And uh, these are on uh, quad ruled paper, and it's, these are projected out at uh, six meters. But it is nice. It, we can get a very, well, it can demonstrate what we want to, uh, want the students to learn here is these interference patterns. Uh, some of the advantages of this design is, well, we have continuous operation of the laser pointer to it by depressing the button. Ease of alignment. The experiment that we do, we would perform in the lab would uh, involve a uh, helium neon laser, an optical rail. The slits were etched in, um, in reflective mylar, and then we would have our projection screen at the end of the optical rail. This, uh, that setup was a, always a little bit prob problematic because we would get retro reflections off the, uh, off the slits, and then we'd have laser beams flying all over the uh, lab. And, we did not want that. And so with the, uh, now we have to admit that these inexpensive laser pointers are not very un er, uniformly manufactured. They tend to, their laser beam tends to eg exit the hole at various angles. But we found that if we just rotate the barrel of the laser pointer, we can still get sufficient illumination on the slits or on the target to, uh, to produce our interference pattern. Now, some of the limitations are is that, well, 3D printing, when you're 3D printing precise slits, it's not that variation in the material and the and the machines are manufactured for making items that are a little bit larger in scale. This affected the student measured values, but we also kind of turned this around to say, you know, this is, you know, we talk about, you know, man and, um, oh, what else? But all, yeah, manufacturing tolerances, and then, uh, Another unique thing about it was it, with, because of the variation in the slits, the students get, did not exactly arrive at the, well, did not arrive at the same uh, measurements for their, for the, interesting, so it would be easier to tell if the students were uh, collaborating <laughs> behind the scenes. PLA, for this, a very common material to use for 3D printing. It's polylactic acid. It does kind of have a, it's great in room temperatures, but if the students were to leave their lab kit in a hot car and the lab kit was in 
can warp some of the material. But the good thing about that is they're very inexpensive to make, so we can just go to the 3D printer and have another one made quite easily. Uh, some of the improvements we're working on is to use a different material for a whole different technology. Resin printers can print at our desired So we're looking into printing that. That's uh, very different from fused filament printing that most filament. The resin printers print a little bit differently and there's a lot more to the resin printing. You actually have to uh, post because it's, a, it's cured by UV light so you have to heart cure it before you can use it, because otherwise it's very soft. Um, we've checked into using uh, some of the low cost th uh, plastic gratings in our in an empty slit, and we're trying to see what we can do with creating circular half barriers to see uh, what we can do with that uh, with those patterns. creating our interference patterns, and we do have it, where the little caveat there, it is sufficient for introductory labs. You know, we're not looking to create, you know, very precise patterns or, yeah, we're, we, or we're, yeah, it's, yes, let me just say it is sufficient for the introductory labs. The cost of the holder inserts and laser pointer is about $7 and uh, the students achieve the results in a lab, with, well, in their home lab, without uh, direct assistance. Uh, I have brought the entire lab kit with me. This is for our uh, covers, uh, waves, sound, um, electricity, and optics, and I do have uh, uh, kits with the, yeah, well, Yes, with the uh, with our uh, um, yes, sorry. Yeah, with our interference and diffraction uh, setup. All right. Any questions? Yes. Uh, I I'd be very interested in making one of these. Do you have uh, the three D printing files to share and the instructions? Yes, the, uh, yeah, this one is posted on uh, Thingiverse, and it is um, SVSU Physics Lab is the uh, username. This seems to me like a really creative and fun uh, when you couldn't see your students. What was your student feedback like? Did they have fun? It seemed like they did. Um, part of the requirement was them uh, video making a video of them performing at least part of the experiment. And it was interesting that they got to be cr pretty creative. And uh, a lot of them felt like they had to explain what they were doing, too. And I thought that was really, uh, uh, that, I think, direct feedback we got was how the students were explaining what was going on. Uh, during the I taught um, used a very explicit teaching of uh, propagation of error as opposed to just using significant figures. How are you handling error? And the reason I ask that is because as a suggestion, because you're dealing with these measurement tolerances, right? Yes. One of the things that I found was amazing about that the way this lab was being taught, and I'd never was that the students could got out of like, well, the answer's wrong, but we don't know why, so human error, it moved them out of that, because they could start with like, what the, and they got that error, and then they, whatever error from all the 
other measurements they had and could propagate to the end and say, hey, our final value is within our error bars. So we feel like we got it right. And it kind of changes that relationship to that kind of a, a measurement error problem. So I don't know how you're doing measurement error, but uh, I thought it would be something interesting to consider. The uh, calculations and it's well we we explain it during the analysis and uh, you know, rules like if it is a uh, uh, well yeah any of the market you would say that the error that is half of the smallest markings you know some of the standard rules of thumb for uh, error. of why that was, uh, you know, why we're saying that's where it's uncertain. Yeah, I think that helped with the students also. Um, now that you've done this virtually and you've, you've gone through all this, creating all this equipment and stuff, would you now do use in person because it is uh, much easier easier for the students to uh, manipulate. Um, that was uh, that one we use in the lab. Just because it's it optical rails out and uh, you know have the the heavy duty light sources they're just using a little incandescent bulb. for the lenses. Thank you, John. Thank you. Personal items that I've 3D printed up here, too. I was hoping to get a lot of my lab equipment, but I tried downloading the file from, from work. Uh, Welcome to our for today, Mr. Mike Smale. All right, good morning. Good morning. Hi. <laughs> My name is Terry in Chicago. And I'm going to be talking uh, a little bit about a teen internship program that we built using the Open space software. So, uh, Adler has a teen intern program where we bring in one to two dozen uh, high school aged students from around the Chicagoland area. These are by an interest in astronomy or science, but uh, have a genuine interest in working with the Adler to uh, increase their increase their skill sets. And they Some are looking for technical specific skill sets, some are looking for uh, public speaking experience, some are, it's the, the values are. Uh, 
a variety of departments around the building, and that gives them the chance to, again, learn more about the daily operation of a modern museum. Now, during the course of the internship, they, it's a six-week program, and as part of that, the teams also create a sort of capstone project, kind of a, a major uh, a reflection of what they worked on over the course of the summer, and then they share that with their family and friends at a And this summer, I mentored uh, two teen interns in open space. Uh, open space, you should be going automatically, but uh, it is a <laughs> it's, it's the world's finest black hole simulator. All right, well, let's uh, <laughs> let's keep going. So, uh, this is a visualization export from open space, which is a. <laughs> data visualization software uh, designed to visualize the entire known cosmos and humanity's efforts to explore and understand it. Uh, Adler is one of several informal science institution partners on uh, the Open Space Grant. And uh, uh, but this was the first time that they had worked directly with me and our, and our team and our team program. So it was a chance to kind of uh, rethink and reinvent what we did uh, a little bit. So the first thing we need to do is figure out exactly what we were going to have these folks working on. So the interns we had in 2019, for example, um, sorry, the 2020 interns, uh, the 2019 interns did a lot of uh, Apollo-focused uh, detail. There was a, a, a tremendous number of a scene from the uh, prep for the 2019 community bash for the interns who were working in the theater uh, with their uh, Apollo content. Uh, but what we decided to do this year was to sort of put the, the control of and then run with that. So what we ended up doing was uh, having both interns work on a miniature planetarium show, about a five-minute presentation. And we had, we had some other ideas at first. We, we threw around you know, the idea of maybe uh, we have uh, active social media channels for our teen intern program. We thought, oh, maybe we can have them like, make some videos, make some vignettes. But... Uh, we ultimately shelved that idea because we were worried that it might take so long to get the hang of the software that by the time they were there, they might have not been able to have produced as uh, robust an output of, uh, of media assets uh, to stretch over the course of the summer. But miniature, miniature show, miniature planetarium show is where we went. Now, one thing that we do know from past experience is open space is a very robust software. It does not run uh, on all. Uh, it requires a pretty, a pretty beefy computer to run, uh, to run well, uh, successfully, and to run smoothly. So. Uh, and this was an entirely remote the physical library building or our on-site facilities or resources. So to set them up in a position to succeed, we sent them all uh, laptops that were uh, custom designed to be to beefy enough to support and to run and handle open space properly. Uh, we also provided a mouse, which is surprisingly important uh, for <laughs> flying around the universe. Um, and we yeah, shipped those to all of them before the internships actually started. So the first week of the, okay, this is not even a video. This is, well, I'm oh, sorry. Let's try this one more time here. All right. Video. Imagine you're pulling out of the solar system, flying to Mars, and flying to Saturn. That's, um, <clears throat> so the, the first week was basically the chance to expose them to the software. So we, we, we walked through uh, Different, uh, the assets, the different sort of uh, the, the modules, the packages it has. And the goal for the end of the first week was basically to come up with their, their top, what they wanted to do. A number of uh, tutorial videos online that they watched to sort of get the hang of the, the basics of how the software works. Um, and it's interesting because one of the things that Open Space actually, as many of you probably know, does very, very well are uh, planetary terrains, topology, uh, and terrain data. Uh, and I figured at least one of them would want to do something with that end, but they actually didn't. So we had uh, one intern, uh, Janice, who decided to do a short show on the life cycle of stars and a uh, short show on exoplanets. So, uh, and then week two started with a, uh, a surprise software update. Uh, a new version of Open Space was released. Uh, the, it was like the Friday afternoon uh, of week one. So we got back together at the beginning of week two. And one of, there was some uh, uh, JWST, there was some, some, new, uh, some new data, uh, but there was a lot of new exoplanet data and functionality in this update. Knowing that would be specifically important to one of our interns, we walked them through how to download, install uh, all the, uh, the appropriate files uh, on their fifth day. Uh, an unexpected surprise that actually worked, uh, worked fairly well. 
the rest of week two, we discussed sort of ways to produce the uh, to sort of produce the show, and we looked at both narrative script writing, uh, but also storyboarding as a method. So throughout the internship, we had several sessions uh, with both internal uh, Adler experts, like Andy Johnson, our uh, vice president for museum experience and collections, also non-Adler experts like Mary Holt from the California Academy of Sciences. They were able to connect in, work with our internal, expand that experience, both in some in some ways that were uh, directly relevant, like we worked with one of our uh, one of our writers for uh, some of the script writing components, uh, but then also just to just to experience. Uh, we also include the interns on all team and department and divisional meetings. We wanted them to again feel like part of the team. You know, they 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 weren't just you know here. They weren't in the way. They weren't a hassle. They were actually part of our team for the course of the summer. Uh, this let's see. This is a. <laughs> Pull away from the Earth uh, with picture of the sort of exoplanet markers up, and then we sort of fly out the cone of the uh, the Kepler. Uh, the, the <laughs> um, this uh, week's uh, two, and then going into week three is also where we worked on how to record tours in open space. So uh, open space gives you the ability to sort of export. And because the final community bash was virtual, uh, something that we learned from the, the 2020 uh, virtual sort of community bash was that. Uh, Streaming it from the team's home internet connections onto Zoom was not the best idea. Uh, it, it just uh, you know, network problems, right? So uh, what we decided is a, a different approach is that the teens would create tours in open space. They would send the tours to me. I would outport. I would make the movies. The presentation was actually put together in slides. So it was slides, but it was heavy on uh, visuals and uh, still images and movies from open space. Um, uh, throughout. All right. Also, uh, one of the nice things about that uh, previously aforementioned new version of Open Space is it actually has now a much more things uh, and making movies out of them. Uh, weeks three and four were mostly focused on refining the narrative concept. You know, when you're not in, in this case, neither of these teams were particularly uh, concept of that. So it was a lot of learning, and when you first start trying to internalize something, you're, you're, you're reading it, you're reading it, you're reading it, and when you say it out loud, it just sounds like you're reading it. Be more comfortable with the material, learn how to phrase things in a more natural, more conversational way, uh, so that it didn't just sound like they were you know, reading a Wikipedia page about the Orion Nebula, for example. Uh, had we a little bit more time over the course of the internship, we might have actually pre-recorded their for the final presentation, just to make it a little bit smoother. But uh, with sort of the, the time we had, that's what we ended up doing. We just did a, a live narration over the top of these tours. Thank you. So it was interesting that both uh, both teams actually took two very different tacks. Uh, Janice started with storyboard. She made her own sort of artwork and then created the, uh, the sort of the narration, the story behind it, uh, whereas Justin went the other way. And he wanted to get out and then went and found and tracked down and created visuals to custom fit that. Of course, there, there's no right answer, right? They, you know, visuals and, and scripting all sort of come together. Uh, but it was it was nice to see that everyone is highlight uh, what makes sense to them, and part of being flexible and pulling the th this off is being able to roll with that uh, and being able to move forward. Uh, I hinted at this, but it was actually very uh, it was a very good idea to give the interns focused goals each week. So at the beginning of the week, to be like, okay, here's the plan for this week. Here's what we're going to go through. Now, we were sort of constructing this new from the beginning. So we had kind of a, a schedule planned out, but it was ultimately a, a bit of a guesstimate because we didn't know like how long would it actually take for them to do some of these tasks. Uh, so again, with the, the, the key word of flexibility there is learning to sort of roll with it as you move along. And the, the weekly goals were good because they helped us keep on track and keep from getting too far behind. So all of a sudden, you know, it wasn't like the last week and we're like, oh, crud, we have, you know, uh, we have uh, nothing done. I said at the very beginning, this is, we also have a sort of an Adler teen intern program. So the interns worked with us Tuesday through Friday. The, the first week of the intern sort of met as a larger teen internship cohort where they did some other sort of professional development uh, work. So there was budgeting. That was uh, so like that's the bit of there's the, the first week. Uh, and the, the, what, the sort of teen programs, cohort programming, and then, for example, some of our sort of sample schedule. The three. Uh, five weeks, again, five weeks on the, the open space part, and uh, sort of an open week uh, before that. Uh, wrapped up, they did a fantastic job. Uh, I was pleasantly, I was very surprised with how the, the final presentations went. Um, 
And then real quick, a couple takeaways here. Uh, first and foremost, uh, pay your interns. This is 2021. Experience never paid the bills. Uh, the, uh, honestly, the, the unpaid internships are a major uh, progenitor, driver, and exacerbator of the inequality and accessibility issues we face in the field. So pay your interns. A remote program, challenging, but doable. Uh, there were plenty of times in the course of the summer where I said, look, oh, But uh, you know, modern communication tools, Slack and Meet and Zoom, we were able to we were able to work those things out. But if you do have the option, I would recommend any sort of any more of an in-person uh, in program here. Uh, I mentioned it earlier: be flexible, but don't stretch yourself too thin. Don't drive yourself so nuts trying to accommodate every little thing that you lose out on uh, the benefits of these interns in the first place. Uh, be aware of other external influences that may affect your program. Uh, part of being a good manager of people is supporting your staff and putting them in a position to succeed. Uh, our teams had some. Uh, uh, Curveball too thrown at them over the course of the summer due to some uh, a variety of communication uh, issues. They handled it with aplomb. They were great. But again, all part of being flexible is supporting your team. Uh, practice, practice, practice. There are many maxims about proper practice preventing poor performance. Incredibly crucial in, the, in a situation like this to handle that. Uh, and last but not least, uh, one more time for people in the back. Pay your interns. <laughs> uh, I have 21 seconds left for questions. So I'm just going to, uh, oh, so, OK. <laughs> Yes. Okay, so we have um, a question from Sarah Schultz on, on Zoom. Um, actually, it's a couple questions. So, um, one, how did you get these interns? Two, what skills do they need to come to the program with? And can you share your application? Uh, I can probably find the application, yes. Uh, so, the, the, the interns apply to us. We uh, Post these, we share them through a variety of uh, school networking channels that we've already developed. They're shared on it. The, the announcement of the sort of Adler Summer Intern Program is available on our website and social channels. Uh, honestly, in this case, we asked specifically for interns that were maybe a little more of self-starters because we knew this was, was going to be, I think it needed a little bit more sort of remote um, on the fly work. Um, but was a, a stable home internet connection, and we actually had some uh, some Wi-Fi repeaters for folks who didn't, so we would be able to support uh, that. Uh, but yeah, there's there's more. There'll be more in the proceeding stacks. If you have any questions, thank you, Mike. Our next presenter is Tiffany Stone Wolbrick. Yay, there's connection. And she's almost there. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to talk with you guys about uh, an initiative that I've been working uh, with a group of people um, that I might be interested in joining this new community. Um, this is the, the Network for the Earth Space Research, Education, and Innovation with Data, or <laughs> um, And this is an initiative that is uh, supported strongly from, for, from the um, Associated Universities, or AUI which is here, who, um, who I'm um, You know, 
know, AUI is still somewhat new to our field, so I wanted to take just a moment to explain first what is AUI. Um, it does a lot of research and development with a strong focus on education and public engagement. Um, but at the core is uh, we do scientific, we collaborate with the scientific community to uh, build and plan and manage large Um, these are all facilities that AUI manages, the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia, the VLA in New Mexico, and Al there as a, a partner to help manage lar the complexity of large projects. So uh, working behind the scenes to make, to enable those scientific uh, discoveries, making it clearing the way for that to happen. Um, and, and that's at all scales. So something as big as ALMA to, to smaller projects and initiatives. Um, and again, I, I'm on the team that really focuses on the education and public engagement. So uh, AUI has some projects that you've probably heard of. Big astronomy, I'm sure you guys have heard of that one at this conference, I hope. Um, ASAP is another one that you guys might be interested in, um, and if you have questions about that project, uh, definitely come talk to me. That is the uh, Astronomy Astronomers in Chile Educator Ambassadors Program. It's actually how I was all through this program. It takes any astronomy educator, formal, informal, casual, uh, on the weekends, sidewalk astronomers, whatever, anyone who loves astronomy and loves to share that with their communities. Uh, you can apply for this program, takes you to Chile, and you get to tour all these amazing facilities and learn about some of the world's best facilities, uh, astronomical facilities. So great program. Um, I hear that the 2020 cohort is finally going to get to go <laughs> to Chile. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, and then I do um, for developing accessibility tools in astronomy. So they do a lot of uh, uh, tactile things uh, for blind Project, if you haven't heard of it, uh, feel free to come talk to me about any of those. Uh, here are some partners that you may or may not have heard of. Um, National Society of Black Physicists, uh, Astronomers Without Borders. The one at the top, Corfo, that's a newer one. That's a Chilean um, clean mining and uh, energy storage initiative. Lots and lots of uh, partners. Those are just a couple of examples. And But the one I wanted to focus on again is this new one, Myriad. So uh, Nereid, Nereid's mission is to uh, advance the research and innovation through a Earth science and space sciences. This is uh, Earth, space, Earth and space sciences are somewhat siloed traditionally, but we have common challenges that if we sit in a room and talk about, we might be able to think of creative solutions. So Nereid's trying to be that space uh, here are some of our goals. Um, I won't just—I won't read them off, but um, we really want to create this sort of community, a community of practice, where we in a space where we can um, solve some of these problems and uh, just discuss the big cha the challenges around big data. This is something that's not going away for either field. So Nereid brings Earth and space data scientists and the data science communities together. It's not just data scientists, but educators, policymakers, uh, anyone in those areas. Uh, and the hope is to start to begin to conduct research, which we already have, develop tools, and just engage these uh, engage new communities and get them to work together. Uh, we also want to address uh, the real pro real world problems and develop this community with shared goals. So uh, I probably don't have to explain this to many of you guys, but it, this is timely. With Nereid is, has emerged because of this need. Uh, there's a ton of data in both of these fields. They represent a huge portion of accumulating data in the world. Um, and we know from like the, the VRO, the Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, will produce 7.3 petabytes of data per year, it's, inc it's incredible. How are we going to take that data 
and manage it? And how, as planetarians especially, how are we going to take that data and use it in a meaningful way uh, to educate our, our audiences? So these are the big questions we're trying to tackle in Myriad. Uh, this started as a workshop at Green Bank. Um, it was a two-day, two, three-day two, three retreat. They locked us in a room, and we were and like, solve the world's problems. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, and, uh, and then we published a book about some ideas that we had. And, uh, and now we're sort of pursuing some of those ideas. And it's been fun and exciting. And, and we're picking up new focus as we go along. And um, we're hoping, you know, one of the shorter term goals is to create this environment again To now that we're getting in a place where we're starting to meet in person again. The idea is to get um, our membership uh, in a physical space and, and start talking about these ideas and what our next steps will be. In the meantime, we have this, uh, this event that's going on virtually. It's a ton of fun. I, I'm uh, on the planning committee of this, and we always just have a lot of fun planning it and a lot of fun uh, at the actual event. It's called Convergence on Tap. Uh, it's, it's a virtual pub. It's just meant to be a casual space where we uh, wax philosophically about different topics related to Nereid. We start uh, tackling some of these problems in sort of creative, casual settings. Uh, so the, the, one, the picture on the left there, the See the Stars, is an example of a past event. Um, we had a, let's see, he was a, a like a deep ocean expert, come and talk for a few minutes. And then we had the, uh, I don't want to say this wrong, I think he was a program scientist for NASA for all of the Europa missions. And he came and spoke for a little while. And then they, it was it's always fun because um, sometimes the, the speakers, they don't know each other, but their works overlap because there is this convergence between our two, uh, between these two disciplines. And, uh, and then they usually like, nerd out together about, like, you know, the oceanographer is like, oh, space is so cool. And then the Europa guy is like, oh, well, NASA does all these tests in the ocean to plan on these for these missions. And, and then um, we have these really just interesting conversations that sort of evolve um, naturally. Uh, our next one, I'm really excited, is, is planned for January 19th. Um, we're still workshopping the, the title. But it's going to be about... Uh, the, the ethics and the moral um, uh, responsibilities of, of people who, f of explorers. So when we enter new frontiers, like uh, as we have private companies that are entering space, that's a great example, right? Uh, what, are, what are their responsibilities to society um, when they're exploring those, those new frontiers? And there's examples of that in the deep ocean as well. So uh, it's just a really fun, casual space to come and meet people and talk and think, learn new things, uh, consider things you already know from different angles. Um, I, I recommend coming. It's great. It's free. It's fun. Uh, join Nuria, I think, if, you, if this is at all interesting to you. Uh, come join us. Uh, it's fun. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's free. And um, it, you know, we have members, and so there's there's a lot of benefits. I'm, I'm not going to read them all off there, but uh, there's a, really a lot of opportunity here. It's still new. It's a new network. It's growing, um, but we have a lot of interest and a lot of uh, energy and excitement and momentum. So we'll get there. I'm excited. Does anyone have any questions? I have about a minute. Oh, two minutes after this. Oh. I was talking past at the end there because I thought I only had a minute. Excellent. Yes. Um, now that you know you, you guys have been exploring this, they lock you in a room, you get all this data, and you <laughs> put it all together. Do you feel like there's there's hope and momentum from it that now that you've seen it in action, is there a lot of room for growth with this? Oh, absolutely. I think I think Neri has a ton of potential, and um, it just uh, I got to meet so many people that I didn't. Um, I didn't understand their careers really because they just you're not involved with you know, data scientists. You know, I have a much better understanding of what that looks like by having conversations with people in Myriad. So you know, and and then realizing how much we they all kind of a sense that, but having those conversations about what are the common problems we're trying to solve and why are we doing them separately? Why aren't we talking together and, and trying?
other questions? I thought I saw some hands. Yeah. And oh, I apologize. But is this um, developing curriculum for the educational realm or on top of understanding and using the big data? I didn't hit on that very hard, but yeah, the educators are, are a huge, uh, a really important uh, people to have a seat at this table, and they certainly do a lot of formal and informal educators in the area that, that's, ha that's having these discussions. So there's no, it's, it's still very new. That's the, that's the goal, is to get these people uh, in a room and, and, and think about n new ways to develop curriculum to handle data and to teach, uh, promote conversation within the network, yes. Final questions? Thank you. And our next speaker is Mike Murray. Yeah, it's great to get out of the cave, isn't it? I don't know about you, but for the first uh, for the first few hours here, it was like, wow, I've got a skills. <laughs> yeah, my German shepherds are still learning how to resocialize too. Anyway, hey, thank you. Uh, it's needed to shut down because of the pandemic, but we did continue a very active online presence. We did a lot with uh, virtual field trips. Coordinator for the area. Uh, we did a lot of YouTube videos that were specific to uh, astronomy topics that even astronomy uh, our station, which goes into a podcast, et cetera, et cetera. But we also liked to do monthly programs. We discovered something. Let me make sure I've got the right button. Yes. We found that depending on the topic, we could get varying amounts of responses. Last January, when I chose the Northern Lights as a topic. Now, up to that point, we might get anywhere between 50 and 100 people that would tune in live. We announced the program. We would see between, you know, five and 6,000 people who were notified, you know, not attended, but actually, you know, well, I posted the announcement of the program on Facebook late in December, about a month ahead of time. And I'll usually wait a week or two and then I'll put a small amount of, of boosting, as they call it on Facebook, a little bit of promotion, just to see if we can get a little added numbers. That might add about 5,000 more looks. Well, within one week, million people that had at least just, you know, seen it. Again, just a reach. Uh, but there were 47,000 responses, and we were like, holy cow, what happened? Um, homegrown, 
Well, look what happened by the time we got to showtime. By the time January 20th hit, it's like, what in the world? How did this go viral like this? And so I still don't have, any, of course, any concrete answers because who knows what it is that's going to make some particular uh, presentation go viral. But we do have a few guesses. And so I wanted to share with you some ideas uh, in terms of what I think might have contributed. Uh, this is still a little bit of speculation, but some of, of what we did were continuing to Now, I know some of that is because we added so many more followers now. And so there's, there's some of that that plays into the event. But I just wanted to share a few things that I think might have helped. Uh, subject matter, you know, paying careful attention to your theme and whether it's a popular topic, whether it's something that is it just like a, a one-time event or is it something that has some legs that can stick around and continue to interest people for a while. So, of course, if there is something really big like another big bright comet appears, well, of course, that's a great event to capitalize on with your live programming. Um, some of the other programs we put together that did uh, very well, nothing like <laughs> the Northern Lights show, but we're still the, the topics that seem to stand out a little bit and drew uh, fairly well. Again, Comet Neo Wise, you all probably remember these events. And then I did one about uh, binocular astronomy, and uh, that one for some reason really picked up. I think we've, we've got uh, something like 16,000 views of it on our YouTube channel or something like that. So I don't know. Sometimes you just have to experiment with the topics. Other things that I think might have contributed were paying very careful attention to the title and the visuals, the fact that we were using active words like see the northern lights as opposed to learn about the northern lights. Uh, not that people don't like to learn, but I think, again, you got to pay attention to the axioms of advertising and promotion. Certain words will draw better. And, of course, uh, work better in the search engines. Also, calling it a live stream program uh, was very interesting. I think might have contributed. Now, I did get some questions because I've given this presentation before. Did that maybe give people the impression that we were going to show the Northern Lights live? Mm -hmm. Yes, we did get a few people that did ask. But we were very specific in our descriptions, trying not to mislead people that it is a presentation. Now, I did have a live webcam called up from Findlay to look at the Northern Lights to see if they were active. Actually, they were very, very slightly active, and I did show that during the program. So we did, but we did get a few responses that said, I thought you were gonna show the Northern Lights live. And of course, you know, most of us as astronomers, uh, you know, it's, that's like, can, can't you reschedule the lunar eclipse? I mean, don't you just push a button and make it happen? And so, yeah. we, but. We did go through the analytics, by the way. Um, we had, because of how popular the program was, we had 102,000 people tuned in live, by the way, during the program. And so we obviously got a lot of comments. We obviously got, uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, you know, the different uh, responses, thumbs up, hearts, whatever. And we did look through those. There were 36,000 of them. But we could at least look at the different classifications. And as far as the people that gave an angry face, because they prob those were probably the ones that thought it was live, it was only about 3%. So I found that to be acceptable. I didn't feel like we were necessarily misleading anybody. So as far as also making sure that you find a really relevant but spectacular image, the best one that you can find. And this really did get a lot of, of attention. And of course, I did go to the author to make sure I had permission to use it. That's very important nowadays because there are all these automatic search engines that will look at your images and find out if you're um, violating any copyright. So that's more important than ever. Uh, making sure that you have a clearly written uh, description of the event can be really helpful. Uh, it doesn't need to be really verbose, but you do want it to, you know, sound attractive and interesting to your audience. You know, we focus on the fact that it's a very highly visual presentation. You know, we don't use words like lecture, things of that nature. You know, we want it 
We want people to feel like, hey, this is going to be entertaining as well as informational. Uh, again, there, is, there are options for paying uh, for paid advertising because you can really expand your reach. And obviously, you can go to great lengths. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Mesmerica program, the James Hood program mm -hmm. that was going around the country. One of the reasons is that those shows sold out virtually every place they went, even though the tickets were 30 to 40 bucks. A lot of us were like going, are you kidding? Who's going to come to a planetarium and see a show even though it's a good entertainment show for 40 Every single show we did sold out, and it's because they invested so much money in Facebook boosting advertising. Now, of course, we don't have that kind of budget, but you know, we can throw 40 50 maybe even $100 from time to time if we think it's a really uh, potentially viable program. So it's good to think about that. And you can, what's nice about it is that you can specifically target the groups you want your advertising to go to. Uh, it really helps to reach if you can go out and find uh, co-sponsors. Maybe it's your parent institution, like for us is Delta College, or maybe there are um, amateur astronomy networks, uh, and just searching through uh, some of the various areas, and you know, Michigan has several. Uh, so we were able to really expand the awareness of the program by doing just that, and that doesn't cost you anything. So really expanding, and, and any of the other networks that you use, whether it's, again, like the, the podcasting or what have you. Um, and other, again, yeah, some of the other affiliate organizations you can think about. We're connected with the marketing group in the downtown Bay City, uh, downtown management board. So it really helps to develop relationships in your community that can help you get the word out. Another thing that I wanted to pay very careful attention to was, especially if I wanted to grow our audience, I wanted to make sure that the presentation really delivered, at least as close to expectations as possible. So we didn't do these presentations uh, on a regular basis because I wanted to invest a month in order to really find all of the best spectacular visuals that I could to keep the visual movement and visual quality up there, the pacing. And while video is fantastic, you can really draw some great attention, uh, I think you all know about the bandwidth limitations when you're doing anything on social media. And so expect it to get really stuttery and, um, thank you, and very uh, limited. So uh, some of the things that can help with that, though, is make sure that your video is not moving. It's not incredibly fast-moving video because it's a little easier to, when you're capturing occasional frames for it to make sense. So I was always, I did use some video. We did go live, like I mentioned, to, to see some things. And, but we had to be very careful. We spent more of our time on just really spectacular still imagery. All right, so a little bit of a recap there. Making sure that we could put all of the, the, the quality into it, but also expanding the reach uh, to make it as, uh, to get as much power and reach out of it as, as a um, generic, what's that, the homegrown um, uh, development. So things like this really, I think, helped. And of course, uh, one of the other big benefits was after an event like that, any big event, you really see your likes and followers jump up. Uh, we went from about 6,000 followers to 60,000 followers after that one event. And so it's great because now every time we go live, uh, I've got between 100 and 500 people that are tuning in live. And they're, we've got a following from all over. For some reason, I have a huge following from, from Scotland <laughs> and New Zealand. And so it, we all, they always come back and say, hey, I'm back. Hi from Italy, you know, all that stuff. And so it's, it is great to be able to expand the following. And it, it's nice to be able to share those success stories with your administration. Hey, how many people tuned in? Oh, just 100,000. So anyway, that, those are the highlights. Those are our, our, our addresses. And it looks like we have a couple of minutes for questions.
Uh, so we have a question from um, our Zoom uh, watchers from uh, James Switzer. Switzer? I don't know. Sorry, James. <laughs> Right, okay, anyway. Um, why do you think the auroras are so popular these days? And then he also said, great talk and amazing work. Thank you. You know, I, it's hard to tell. One of the reasons that I chose that topic is because every time I gave it as a, as a live special event at the planetarium, it always sold out. And maybe some of that is because of where we live. And usually it's better if you go up to the UP, of course. But... Uh, that has seemed to have been a, a very popular topic, and now that the sun is becoming more active, if you've noticed with some of the recent aurora displays. Uh, Mike, fantastic. Uh, I've been following this for quite a while, so it's nice to, to see you in person talking about it, too. Thank you. Kind of the world starts to reopen, and you... you probably going to start to see a bit of a drop off in virtual following. Do you have some plans to kind of leverage all those people that you have following now into some more live programs, some other ways to reach those people? Programs that we're doing at the planetarium, but we do plan to continue doing our virtual programming. We may not to be able to do this. We were doing one new YouTube video a week. And of course, now that we have reopened, uh, we had to scale back the frequency of those. But we want also. So yeah, thank you. We we discovered that we're we're finding a lot of new uh, people who will eventually and have started to come to the planetarium because they. Thank you, Mike. All right. Thank you, everybody. of Philippa in 1964. I don't know if you might recognize one particular person. Yeah, go ahead. There in the back, third from the left. And restoring a lot of the photos. I, um, I have to admit, to start with, that this is a rather selfish presentation because I'm sharing about the work, the great work. Um, I hope it's not perceived as a um, self-promoting. It's really more about, I hope, uh, an opportunity to start a conversation around the role of data and authenticity in the content that we all that we all produce. California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, uh, and we showed it last night to a group of hardy individuals who decided to stay late at the planetarium. The making and tells the story of the coevolution of life and our planet and how that informs our search for life elsewhere. I'm not going to talk about the story. All of the ways that we integrated data into the show. And 
Uh, I will start by saying that every show that we produce at the California Academy of Science Advisors. So this is a, a hybrid meeting that we had early on in the upper middle. You can see our meeting room at the SETI Institute. They hosted an opportunity for us to have a conversation with some of their scientists on site. Uh, in the lower left is Jill Charter, who is the inspiration for Jodie Foster's character on, uh, in Contact. Uh, Natalie Battaglia is highlighted in the lower right. Uh, David Grinspoon, potential cast that maybe you'd recognize, about the co-author of the book on, uh, on uh, the New Horizons mission, uh, is another advisor. These are the people who really help shape the story and also introduce us to the cutting edge science and to some of the data providers that we rely on uh, for telling the story. Early on in the story, we go to the Atacama Desert. We wanted to highlight how we use that as a region where we test rovers. And so um, this is all integrated into accurate uh, digital elevation maps of, uh, of the Atacama. Uh, but this is the uh, Zoe rover, which was made by the uh, Carnegie Mellon Institute, um, uh, uh, Robotics Institute. And uh, it's a, we started with a CAD model. We were able to then flesh that out into something that was photoreal. You never really expect to have conversations about how much dust is appropriate to put on a computer-generated model, but those are the kind of conversations you end up with. There's actually a handprint if you look closely uh, as the show goes on so that you can get a sense of the scale. Uh, the, um, the sound that you hear is of the rover crossing the desert, uh, and then actually the drill bit is actually recordings from the Carnegie Mellon uh, University team. Uh, they provided that, and that was integrated into the scene. We then drill into, uh, 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 fly into a rock that's turned over by the drill, uh, and, uh, and inside that, that's a 3D scan of a, of a sample that was provided by the SETI Institute. Uh, we then, th that sort of highlights the one kind of type of life that we're talking about looking for, which is sort of life that's in what we refer to as nanoclimates in the show, sort of niches, which are uh, kind of where we're going to look for life in our solar system. Mars and Enceladus are places that are, they're not planets that have been transformed by life. These are planets where you have to, as we say in the show, dig deep for life, uh, for signs of life. But we want to talk about exoplanets, and there we're going to be looking at spectra, and we're going to be looking for planets that have actually been transformed by life on them, if we're going to find evidence of that. And as our advisors were quick to say, it's hard to even imagine Earth without life. Earth is very much a living planet and has been shaped by life, and that's the fundamental story. But we wanted to introduce this concept of spectra in the show. So this is a scene that we actually tested a lot with audiences. We show authentic spectra. All of these are either observed spectra or calculated spectra that are used for research. Uh, so throughout the show, as we refer to this, we, um, we, we build on this initial presentation of the spectra, and we present um, uh, real data throughout the show. Going from modern Earth, we wanted to go back to the past. So we visit um, Earth during the um, uh, uh, Carboniferous era. You can see uh, some of our um, relatives of dragonflies here. Uh, the dragonfly models were modified based on input from uh, Jessica Ware at the American Museum of Natural History. They're, um, they're not anatomically the same as modern dragonflies, so we had to take off-the-shelf models and modify them and modify the, the, the flight behavior in order to make them match. All of the plant life was um, a appropriate plant species and distribution, modified in terms of the look and the, and the distribution in, the, in this area. Uh, these are the first forests, basically, that take root on land. And they, um, that was uh, advised by the University of California Berkeley team uh, as well as people at the National Museum of Natural History. Uh, we then continue to go back into the past. I haven't talked about Snowball Earth or Hadean Earth, which are both in the show. We go to Mars. This is not this is Mars about four billion years ago. It's not the typical presentation of Mars. Typically, you sort of take modern Mars and you just flood it. Uh, we, didn't, we actually erased all of the craters that were younger than four billion years old. So if you know your Martian geography well, you won't see those. Uh, we also have a relatively smaller ocean. Uh, it's... Um, it's actually one of the important messages that we wanted to get across is that uh, the, the Great Northern Ocean would have formed over time. And so you have sort of these local minima that collect water. And so we wanted to show how a lot of that transport of water underground is fundamental to where we look for life because that water that flows underground, uh, that flowed underground, may still flow underground, uh, is where you'd look for evidence of past life and maybe even uh, modern life on Mars. When we go to modern Mars, this is actually uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter high rise data. Uh, for the elevation, we chose particular locations. This is uh, Neely Fossey. This is one of the rare areas where we've detected methane on Mars. And um, use stereo pairs to get a three-dimensional terrain. And then the color mapping is from uh, ESA's um, HRSC, High Resolution Stereoscopic Camera. We then travel farther out into the solar system. 
Uh, this is our Enceladus model. Uh, we worked in collaboration with Paul Schenk at the Lunar Planetary Institute. Um, if you are sort of pro tip, if you want to look for where you've seen together real data of planets, look for variations in the shadows because different images are collected uh, under different lighting conditions. Uh, so you can tell this is real data because the shadows are kind of wrong. Um, but um, the, uh, the geysers are actually from uh, 2014 paper by Carolyn Porco and her team. And so all of the locations of the geysers, the angles of the geysers, and the relative emissivity of the geysers follows that, um, uh, that, uh, that paper. When we dive under the uh, subsurface, into the subsurface ocean, we wanted to visit these hypo hypothetical hydrothermal vents. Um, for a more realistic distribution events, we went to the Juan de Fuca Ridge in uh, the Eastern Pacific Ocean and looked at overall distribution events. But then when we get up close to these uh, events, the um, general thinking based on our consultation with folks at NASA JPL was that they would look more like the, um, the White City smokers in the Atlantic Ocean. So we worked with a team at Woods Hole Institute, uh, Oceanographic Institute, and uh, the University of South Carolina. They had 4K video that they had shot. We took individual frames of that video, did photogrammetry to recreate uh, this event in three dimensions. And so when we fly up to this, you're seeing a recreation of that location, but stretched vertically by a factor of two because in the lower gravity of Enceladus, you would expect these chimneys to form uh, much, much taller. The simulation showing the uh, flow from the vents, um, we calculated the appropriate velocity, but in the show, it's uh, increased by a factor of 10 because if you showed it at this real speed, you can't tell it's moving. We then highlight this uh, amazing spacecraft, which really inspired this whole scene. Um, it's a group at NASA JPL are proposing this snake-like um, robot that will travel down the crevasses near the south pole of Enceladus. It's cleverly named EELS, which I think is uh, extant exoplanet, exolife something. Um, and actually something would work for us. But anyway, <laughs> clever acronym for this little snake-like uh, robot. Uh, they worked with us. Um, again, the sounds are actually um, recorded from the, from the, uh, from the prototypes. Uh, the prototypes will be tested on Earth uh, in the next year or so. Uh, the color scheme, we worked on with them, and they were so inspired by it that they think they might use it on the actual spacecraft. The, um, uh, the flow is um, we worked very carefully with them, and actually we're co-presenting a paper at AGU this fall on how this collaboration actually highlighted aspects of the mission that, um, that helped them think about uh, what the conditions would be like for the rover. Uh, when we then travel outside the solar system, this is HD 189733b. Uh, uh, hot Jupiter. Um, the atmosphere model is actually a kind of ripped off from Venus, but the movement of the atmosphere is based on simulations by uh, Tiffany Kataria at NASA's JPL. And this is true of the uh, other exoplanet, HD1, uh, HR 8799b, which uh, is a different simulation, which is still actually kind of a work in progress and has not really been finalized yet. Um, when we then are out at this place to look back at Earth, uh, the background here is a radio. Um, image from the GLEAM survey. The GLEAM survey has a giant hole in it because it's, doesn't, it's one location on Earth that did an all-sky image. So our camera moves are carefully <laughs> orchestrated to avoid that uh, gap in the data. Uh, but then we're superimposed with an accurate color given the color representation of GLEAM, um, uh, Earth's radio emission. So it's, Earth would be bright at sort of the lower wavelength and high, uh, higher wavelength um, parts of the gleam image, but uh, suppressed in the middle, so you end up with kind of a purplish look. Uh, the image that you see there, because the three types of um, signals that really escape Earth's ionosphere are um, radio carrier waves, uh, nuclear explosions, and uh, radar, we highlight each of those. This is a shot from the California Academy of Sciences show from the 1950s and 60s, um, which is, uh, was called Science in Action. We then come back to our solar system and talk about uh, uh, sort of on the drawing board technology. Of course, now that the decadal survey has come out, we know that this is a potentially approved um, plan of the star shade model. This is the modified HABEX. And uh, talking about this potential for the technology uh, to actually be able to look at planets in orbit uh, around stars by blocking the light of the stars. We had a talk about interference earlier. 
um, the design, of course, of the star shade is to minimize uh, that diffraction around uh, the light as it's, uh, of, the, of the parent star. And once again, every spectrum that we show is a real spectrum. So working with the University of Washington, these are all uh, in, the shot, in the show. We kind of highlight about 100 some odd spectra of, of different potential exoplanets. These are all spectra that are calculated by the modelers at the uh, University of Washington to think about what to look for as signs of life uh, in exoplanetary signatures. And then finally, we kind of come back to the Bay Area and talk about how if we want to become a civilization that endures long enough to communicate with our galactic neighbors, we better think about how we, our relationship with Earth. Uh, and so we come back to the Bay Area. Uh, there's about 10 different research papers that are actually cited in the credits for this. Uh, these are all plans and ideas for how to create a more sustainable and resilient Bay Area uh, infrastructure. And finally, although I'll mention it last, it's actually um, in the show, uh, takes place between uh, that uh, radio signal and the, uh, and the star shade. Uh, we do a live section with our presenters. This is a snapshot from open space. Uh, luckily, not a movie, because then it would be a black screen. Um, but uh, a snapshot from, uh, from open space of the JWST. It's one of the two storylines that we do for our live sections, highlighting either the potential benefit or potential uh, contributions of JWST to exoplanet work, or talking about uh, the Earth Transiting Zone, which is a paper by Lisa Kaltenegger and Jackie Faraday talking about what exoplanets could actually look at Earth and see it as a transiting planet. Uh, so we, those are the two storylines that we do for our live section. And that's my rapid fire introduction to some of the data that appears in Living Worlds. I'm happy to answer any questions if we have any time left. Well, we're at the end of our time, but we are the last session here, so we've got, it's like a Zoom question. All right, um, so we have uh, another question from, uh, how do you say, James Jim, Schweitzer? Jim Schweitzer. <laughs> I'm still new to the planetarian no world. Uh, now he's learning. my former <laughs> boss, so I can, I can make the, I can do that voice. <laughs> um, so he starts off saying, fantastic looking show, um, thrilling to see how well you incorporate the data. I agree with him. Um, but his question is, uh, how can I see it ASAP on my desktop planetarium? <laughs> well, Jim, you know my email address. But um, now we actually do have a preview if you're interested in watching. Uh, right now what we have is an HD version that uh, uh, is available to preview online. Uh, if you want to preview in a, as a dome format, um, you can reach out to, uh, to me or feel free to talk to, to Dan or Mary Holt and we'll, we'll contact you, get you in contact with, the, with people to, to preview the show. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers for this session. Thank you for coming.